Online Chapel, thanks for joining us online today. It is great to see you, and we are so happy that you're here to worship with you, with us. Uh, I pray that this time together today lifts you up, encourages you, and draws you closer to the God that loves you. Uh, thanks for joining us. We are so glad that you're here. I am reading from John 12, chapter, uh, verses 20 through 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you truth, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Let us pray. Loving God, for the gift of life and for the gift of salvation, for the gift of church and for the gift of community, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus Christ, for the good news of the gospel, and for the capacity to be compassionate and consistent in our love for one another and most of all, our love for you, Jesus. 
Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Dear beloved Christian Friends United Methodists of Indiana, I'm so blessed and pleased and privileged to worship with you this Sunday morning. I want to share for a few moments on the subject, Love That Shines Through. I can remember serving the last church I served before I was elected bishop. It was Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Ohio. And we were hosting a conference where we had a speaker come in speaking to churches, clergy and laity around church development and how to reach new people in our community. And so since we were hosting it, we thought we would open uh, the, the conference with our praise group singing the welcome song we sang on Sunday mornings. The Jesus and me loves the Jesus and you and the Jesus and you loves the Jesus and me. It's so easy, so easy, so easy, so easy to love. And so the conference speaker um, took a few moments to make commentary about our welcome song. Uh, he wasn't overly impressed with how contemporary or novel it was, but he did acknowledge that it seemed to work for us. And that was the case. We simply wanted to communicate to those who were coming to worship that the Jesus in us loves the Jesus in you. And I think one of the prayers I've been praying this time as we've been socially distancing, as we've experienced quarantine, as we've experienced anxiety and angst and ambiguity, is, oh God, what would you have us to do? How would you have us to live in this moment of history, in this liminal space, how would you have us to be faithful when we are fearful? How would you have us to be generous when many of us are, are struggling, many of our parishioners are struggling? How would you have us to feed the hungry when we can't touch them? And I think we can lean upon one another during this season. In times like these, we pray, oh God, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Aldersgate Sunday, in fact, any Sunday, is a good time to ask the question, what is a disciple who is perfected in love? In his 1742 treatise, The Character of a Methodist, John Wesley acknowledges the limitation of the human condition. Sin is the problem. Salvation in Jesus Christ is the solution. Wesley displays a, a profound optimism in what God's grace can accomplish in the life of any and every child desiring to walk with greater integrity in the way of the gospel. Our faith can not only be a source of strength, but an instrument of healing, even in a moment like this. Our faith is a source of strength, is an instrument of healing when it is perfected in Christ's love. To be a Methodist, according to Wesley, meant you must love God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbors as you love yourself. It was Wednesday, May the 24th, 1738. John Wesley experienced his heart being strangely warmed. It was not only an important moment for Wesley or for the Wesleys, but it was for the Wesleyan movement and its future to be characterized as a religious movement of head and heart, grace and action, scriptural holiness and social holiness. This was the heartwarming Aldersgate experience. John and Charles Wesley formed a religious holy club at Oxford University. They had not found much vitality or passion or discipline in campus life at Oxford University. So they began to meet for prayer and for scripture reading and for devotion. They were taking Jesus seriously and they didn't see that happening in other places. And the students began to deride them and to 
jokingly speak about them and call them Methodists because of their methodical way of reading scripture and praying together and caring for one another in community. John and Charles Wesley got it right. In May of 1738, both of these brothers had heartwarming experiences. And even though they had been passionate about the church and the ministry of the church, they did not know Jesus Christ as their personal savior and did not have the assurance of salvation in their faith. They had not accepted Jesus Christ and known the joy and assurance of the faith that comes from accepting him. They had witnessed this deep faith in their Moravian friends when they first came to the American colonies in Georgia. The story is told, the record reads that there was a storm at sea. And in the midst of this storm at sea, when all thought that the ship would sink, the Moravians continued to pray, but did not panic. And after a short, what seemed to be a short and unsuccessful trip to America, the Wesleys went back to England, where once again they came under the influence of the Moravian Christians. And it was on Aldersgate, in Aldersgate, London, after hearing the preface to the Episcopal Romans, John Wesley, John Wesley writes these words about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ and Christ alone. I trusted Christ for salvation and assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You talk about freedom and clarity to know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ has saved you from sin, has forgiven your sins, that loves you beyond description. You talk about freedom. You talk about clarity. You talk about a, a, a deep foundation for faith. The power of the Holy Spirit was at work in Wesley's heart so that he might hear the gospel, they might hear the gospel, and we might experience the gospel in a new way. I want to talk about love that shines through. Love that shines through. The great commandment story is told in the gospel lessons, and this is from Mark, the 12th chapter. First, I'm going to read a little bit from the Common English Bible and then some verses from the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson's. One of the legal experts, verse 28, Mark 12, heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. And he came over to ask a question, which commandment is most important of them all? Jesus replied, you know the answer to this. The most important one, Israel, listen. Oh, God is the one Lord. And you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your being, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. You will love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment, no other commandment is greater than these. The legal expert said to Jesus, well said, teacher. You have truthfully said that God is one and there is no other besides him. And to love God with all of our heart, a full understanding and all of one's strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more important than all kinds of of entire, entirely burned offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered him with wisdom, Jesus said to him, you aren't far from God's kingdom. And after that, no one dared to ask him any other questions. Eugene Peterson puts it this way, the great commandment. One of the religion scholars came up hearing lively exchanges of questions and answers, and seeing how sharp Jesus was in the answers, 
he put him to this question. Which is most important of all commandments? Jesus said the first is important. Listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord with all your passion, passion and prayer, intelligence and energy. And here's the second. Love others, love others, love others as well as you love yourself. There's no other commandment that ranks with these. The religion scholar said a wonderful answer, teacher, so lucid and accurate that God is one and there is no other and loving him with all passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as yourself. Well, that's better than all the offerings. That's better than all the sacrifices put together. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, you are almost there, almost there right on the border of God's kingdom. After that, no one else dared ask a question. So what commandment is the first of all? Jesus answers this and makes it so clear. That hasn't changed based upon the time period we're living in. That hasn't changed. The central confession of Judaism which Jesus shares as a confession of faith for us today to receive as our core commandment. Hear, first of all, hear, the Lord our God is one, the Shema. The Lord our God is one, there is no other. You shall love the Lord your God. This is for us, friends. With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You've heard it a thousand times. There is no greater commandment than these. Two commandments that actually meant one from Jesus. This central core thing, this central core foundation of your faith is for you to love. Love first the God who created you and love your neighbor who you are privileged to, to live with. No program agenda, no projects are to take precedence. No plans, no prescriptions, no parliamentary procedures. Love. Love God first and love neighbor. But friends, I want us to also remember that we cannot love neighbor in a healthy way. We cannot love God in a healthy way and then neglect ourselves. I want to say to, to my pastors, our pastors, as a colleague, as your bishop, God loves you. I love you. I want to say to our laity, Never be ashamed or apologetic about praying for and encouraging your pastors. Every single pastor came from a congregation. They didn't drop from heaven. They didn't come from a closet in the Episcopal office. Every pastor came from a congregation, from a church. Every pastor who's been called by God is equipped by God and sanctioned and certified by the church. And they have been sent to borrow the words from the first lady, my wife, who says it all the time, love the people, love the people, love the people. No program agenda, no project agenda takes precedence. And I believe during this time of a pandemic, it has never been more important than to let the love of God to shine in us and to shine through us. Is there something more important while sheltering in place, while praying for a breakthrough, a turnaround, a cure, a comeback? Mark Sanborn, in his book, How to Succeed When Times Are Up, Down, Good, Bad, or Sideways, he raises this. He says, the greatest challenge as human beings 
is acting on what we know. Mark Sanborn. This book is entitled How to Succeed When Times Are Up, Down, Good, Bad, or Sideways. They've been a little bit of all of that. Our greatest challenge may be acting on the very things that we know. There's some things we should do all the time. Paying attention to God, planting flowers, praising God, saying I'm sorry, communicating by phone or any other means necessary to let people know that we care. Praising God. And so we sing one of the great hymns of the church, an Alders Gate Sunday hymn, an annual conference hymn, a, a great hymn we sing, a Wesley hymn, Charles Wesley hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues, to sing both John and Charles Charles Wesley, his brother, they both had a passion and zeal that translated into working 15 to 18 hour days. I don't recommend that for our pastors, by the way. And some of you have been working long enough where you need to take a break. I've seen it. So Charles and John Wesley weren't the best examples for self-care of loving themselves, but they got it right on loving God and loving neighbor and having a a, a religion and a theology that says that others can be more important than our programs and our agenda. They had a passion and zeal that translated into preaching to thousands. They traveled thousands of miles on horseback, conducting as many worship services as possible. Charles Wesley spent much of his time writing hymns. Some say no less than 6,500 hymns, hymn texts. Ken Osbeck, the music historian, says in 1749, on the occasion of Charles Wesley's 11th anniversary of his own Aldersgate conversion experience, wrote the hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. It is believed that Charles Wesley was inspired by a chance remark by Peter Bowler, the Moravian leader who said, if I had a thousand tongues to praise God, that wouldn't be enough. In the United Methodist hymnal, this hymn has seven stanzas. But when Wesley, Charles Wesley, first wrote the hymn, it had 19 verses, 19 stanzas. Now we complain if we have to sing all seven. Just imagine if you had to sing 19 stanzas. One of those was, many of those verses were actually about his own testimony of his salvation. One of those was, the Lord's atoning blood close to my soul applied. Me he loved, the Son of God. For me, for me he died. The assurance of knowing that Jesus Christ died for you and for me. Oh, for a thousand tongues. To sing. The love of God poured inside us is the substance of our faith. So I don't have answers about when this pandemic will end. I don't have answers about how can we guarantee uh, uh, safety when we step outside of our homes and gather in our sanctuaries. But I do have an answer about this. That the substance of our faith is the love of God poured inside of us. So Bishop, how can I stay centered and remain hopeful, much less joyful when our lives and our way of living has been so disrupted? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I don't know how I feel when I see so many people hurting and dying. I, I know it doesn't feel good. I don't know how to come up with good answers when people ask questions about the perennial nature of those who are struggling. But by grace, I know this, we mean love that comes to us and love that shines through us. Not in just the words we say, but in the deeds that we do. So I'm always inspired. I'm always inspired by 
Leslie Bledsoe, who's the wife of uh, one of our bishops in the United Methodist Church, Bishop Bledsoe from New Mexico in Northwest Texas. She's blind. She's been blind since her 50s, early 50s. And every morning she wakes up, she asks God this question. God, what is my assignment today? So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you wake up tomorrow morning, ask God, what is my assignment today? And remember the words of the great commandment, there is only one Lord, love the Lord your God, not just a little bit, not just a little while, but love the, the Lord your God with all of your soul, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. A short commandment with a long commitment, a deep commitment. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for being God. I would praise God for loving me. I would praise God for loving you. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for you being the church. I would praise God for pastors and the way in which you've been faithful. I would praise God for church leaders and the way in which you have been supportive and faithful. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise God for just being God. If I lived in Japan, I would probably say arigato. If I lived in France or the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo, I probably would say merci. <laughs> if I lived in Nigeria, I might say nagote. If I lived in Tanzania or Kenya, I might say asante. If I resided in Germany, I might say Dakacha. If I lived in Brazil, I might say obrigado. If I was Korean or it was my native language, I might say, come say, hamne da yesu ni. If I spoke Spanish as my native language, I would say, gracias, Jesus. But since I live in central Indiana, and I've worshiped in the north of Indiana and the south of Indiana and the northwest and the, and the east of Indiana all across this state. I simply say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, pastors. And thank you, lay leaders. Thank you, churches, for your generosity. Thank you for worshiping faithfully online. Thank you for keeping your social distance. Thank you for feeding the hungry. Thank you for clothing the naked. Thank you for not giving up or giving out or quitting or stopping. Thank you, people. To the doctors, I say thank you. To the nurses, I say thank you. To the trash collector who came by this morning, I say thank you. To the truck drivers, I say thank you. To the church Clerks, I say thank you. To the grocery cashier, I say thank you. To the people that we overlook, the people that we undercount, the people that sometimes we dismiss, I say thank you, God, for showing us that if we love God, we must also love neighbor. And if we love neighbor, we must also love self. So, dear friends, I'm looking for that love that shines through us so that our kindness may become contagious. Our generosity might be outrageous. Our faithfulness might be timeless. And our compassion might be endless. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God bless you. Let that love shine through. Amen. We're so excited that on March 28th at 11 a.m. we'll be back to worship together in person here at our building uh, on High Street, downtown Lawrenceburg. We cannot wait to have you back in here. I can't wait to gather with you uh, to worship in person. Um, it's going to be great and we'll be sending and posting some information on just the guidelines. Of course, we're going to be wearing masks when we're together. Uh, we'll have pews sectioned off. We'll have some hand sanitizer available and, and ready for you to use. But mark your calendars. March 28th, we'll be back together for worship at 11 a.m. And uh, we hope that you can join us and just looking forward to worshiping together in person on Palm Sunday.